Hello, and welcome to the RSET training, assessing the impacts of fires on watershed health. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the second part of this three-part webinar series. The following slides provide an overview of the training. After participating in this three-part training, participants will be able to analyze the key fire science criteria to select the appropriate data from satellites and instruments for a given watershed. You'll be able to distinguish, compare, and contrast the biophysical conditions pre- and post-fire. You'll be able to acquire land use and land cover maps for the region of interest, select river basin and sub-basin boundaries for your region of interest, and recognize how to apply the soil and water assessment tool, a river basin scale model, to simulate the quality and quantity of surface water and groundwater. The prerequisites for the webinar series are listed below, with links to each of the training web pages. We encourage you to go through these materials to better prepare you for the content covered throughout the three-part training. So why is RSET hosting a webinar on the impacts of fires? Well, wildfires can disrupt transportation, communications, power and gas services, and water supplies. Wildfires tend to lead to a deterioration of air quality and loss of property, crops, resources, animals, and people. According to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, children, the elderly, and individuals with underlying health conditions are particularly vulnerable to the health effects of decreased air quality caused by wildfires. Part 2 of the webinar series will be focusing on earth observations and the soil and water assessment tool for assessing post-fire water quality in watersheds. As a reminder, the homework will be available on the training webpage starting July 13th with the due date of July 27th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. The objectives for the second part of the webinar series are as follows. By the end of part two, participants will be able to identify physically based model components necessary to run a swap model to predict the impact of management on water and sediment in a watershed. Ingest earth remote sensing data into swap model using NASA access and recognize best practices used to conduct calibration in SWAT. Questions are encouraged. If you have any questions, please put them in the question in a question box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session after the presentations and demonstrations have concluded. The remainder of the questions will be answered in the question and answer document, which we, which we will post to the training website about one week after the training has completed. Listed below are the trainers for today's webinar. Dr. Ibrahim Mohammed is a senior research scientist in the Hydrological Sciences Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. His research interests span physical and statistical hydrological modeling and the relationship with climate and land cover, as well as integrating and synthesizing water-related science and engineering research activities to meet the growing demands for integrated professional data analysis. Dr. Amanda Lopez is a geoscience researcher in the Water and Ecosystem Group at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Her research focuses on using NASA remote sensing methods and data products to study water quality, coastal ecology, and marine resource management. We'll now transition to Dr. Mohammed to identify physically based model components necessary to run a SWAP model to predict the impact of management on water and sediment in a watershed. Ibrahim, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ibrahim Mohammed. I'm a senior research scientist at the Hydrological Sciences Lab, part of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, located in Greenbelt, Maryland. Today, I will be presenting an overview of a physically based hydrological model, namely the soil and water assessment tool, and a hydroclimatic tool that is NASA Access. Following my presentation, my colleague Mandy Lopez will highlight a case study work on using the soil and water assessment tool to assess post-fire water quality in watersheds. 
The second session titled Earth Observation and the Soil and Water Assessment Tool, SWOT, for assessing post-fire water quality in watersheds is part of advanced level training webinars on assessing the impacts of fires on watershed health. So this is now the first part, which is the SWOT model overview and NASA access. So let's begin with that. So for today presentation, um, um, we will discuss how to set up a soil and water assessment tool model project. We will be giving details on the SWOT model input data needs, various output, calibration, and verification. We will also introduce a new tool that can provide ready formatted, processed, easily ingested remote sensing data needed, needed to run the soil and water assessment model. Then my colleague will be doing the later part, which is analyzing post-fire water quality data simulated by a soil and water assessment tool model configured over a case study in California. So as you can see here, these are two examples from the soil and water assessment tool configuration. Um, you can see how the detail um, from different um, layers that is going to um, help us to answer a question that is being posed for any watershed study. Let's now uh, go to the SWOT overview. The SWOT is a widely used model in assessing soil erosion prevention and control, non-point source pollution control, and regional management in watersheds. For instance, it has been used to address water management, land use change, and agricultural chemical yield related challenges. The SWOT model development is attributed to several federal agencies and academic institutions, namely um, the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, Agricultural Research Service, ARS, the Agricultural Research Service and Texas A&M University and United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, as well as other agencies. I encourage the listeners to visit the SWOT main page to learn more on the SWOT model development efforts. So if we can try to um, summarize SWOT into few lines. Um, here on your right, you see a hydrograph, and you would notice that this hydrograph is calculated at the Mekong River Streamflow Station in Laos. Often we use or we want to understand the variability of streamflow due to climate or management or human imprint or land cover change. So SWAT is a good modeling candidate that can support applications to solve such challenges. The soil and water assessment tool or SWOT modeling structure combines several components such as hydrology, weather, sedimentation, soil temperature, crop growth, agricultural management. The soil and water assessment tool modeling units are cells, subwatersheds, hydrologic response unit, and usually they call it HRU, and point sources. It is essential to understand how the soil and water assessment model, soil and water assessment tool model deals with simulating various processes. That means care should be given in representation of interactions and processes within a watershed and this is usually the case when we are formulating the HRU. A nice effort by Iowa State University in collecting, analyzing, and maintaining SWOT water and assessment tool literature database can be visited. And you can see here at the top of this slide, um, I gave the link so that you can visit that database. So, and this database is a good source for scholars when working with the SWOT model and it is utility. It has been nicely organized and you can easily find 
um, recent articles related to development, related to applications, and within the application itself, it has ways to um, identify um, uh, different applications easily. Let's now look at the processes that are covered by SWOT. The SWOT model, as you can see in this figure, um, covers several processes. We can name here Ablan processes, um, channel or flood plain processes, transmission losses, evaporation, and sediment routing. Looking at the Ablan processes that are covered by um, SWOT, we can see that they cover hydrology, sedimentation, and other processes as well. Channel processes cover Muskingum routing method, which uses a conservation of mass approach to route an inflow hydrograph. Evapotranspiration processes, um, they cover different methods, such as Penman Monteith, Ristri Trailer, and Hargreaves methods. Knowing the key processes simulated by the SWOT model helps in addressing the problem that we want to study and guide our decision in analyzing the soil and water assessment tool model simulated results. Um, after that, we will look at the SWOT input data. As we can see, um, the SWOT needs input data. And input for the SWOT model is defined at one of several different levels of detail, such as watershed, subbasin, or HRU. Unique features such as reservoirs or point sources must have input data provided for each individual feature included in the watershed simulation. For spatial data, the SWOT model needs a digital elevation model, DEM, for the study area, a soil information, and a land use land cover layer. For MET data input, SWOT model needs precipitation data, minimum and maximum air temperature data, solar radiation, wind speed data, etc. In situ observations um, are also needed, such as reservoir rules and treatment plant operations. Stream flow and sediment data are needed for calibration and verification. Looking at the um, time series on your right, um, we see an example of time series data input for the lower Mekong River Basin. Annual precipitation in millimeters here are colored in blue. And we have also the mean, max, uh, mean annual maximum air temperature in degrees Celsius, as well as mean annual minimum air temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, this input data is needed when we are setting up a SWOT model. Um, now, if we continue on looking at the SWOT output, um, SWOT output, we have several output files that are generated in every SWOT simulation. The SWOT model user can control the printing of output files by editing what we call the master watershed file. So this master watershed, master watershed file is very, very important file because it controls what output the model will spit. Um, average daily values are always printed in the HRU, subbasin, and reach files, but the period they are summarized over will, will vary. That means it can be daily or monthly or annually. The output, via, output files may include all daily values, um, daily amounts average over the month, the year, or the entire simulation period, depending upon the user needs um, that, that has been translated or configured in that water, master watershed file. Um, if we look at the hydrologic cycle, um, just this is a schematic that shows you an overview of the processes that SWOT um, capture. 
And components of water balance, as we can see, they are influenced by climate and physical characteristics of the watershed, such as the river reach network, land use, and soil. The SWOT model partitions the precipitation that you can see that's coming to the um, land into various hydrological processes, such as surface runoff, evapotranspiration, infiltration, percolation, lateral flow, return flow, and recharge to deep aquifer, etc. Um, here we can see um, different compartments, um, such as the root zone, the shallow or undefined, undef unconfined aquifer, and deep aquifer. So these compartments, um, basically, um, they are um, taking the water flux from compartment to another, and in each one, the processes involved, SWAT is able to capture that um, in, uh, by setting up um, different equations. Another cycle that's very important and it is captured by SWAT is the phosphorus cycle. And the three major forms of phosphorus in mineral soils are organic phosphorus associated with humps, insoluble forms of mineral phosphorus and plant available phosphorus in soil solution. Phosphorus may be added to the soil by fertilizer, manure, or residue application, as you can see in the schematic. Um, phosphorus is removed from the soil by plant uptake and erosion. Unlike nitrogen, which is highly mobile, phosphorus solubility is limited in most environments. Now, after um, defining the model inputs and model outputs, and just giving an overview of um, the hydrologic cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and how the processes are configured into SWAT, um, we will um, cover um, some details about the model calibration. Model calibration is a very, very important aspect um, when we are conducting a modeling experiment. SWAT uses many parameters to describe typical soil, plant growth, land cover, reservoir, and agricultural management characteristics. The, luckily, there is the SWAT calibration and uncertainty procedure um, software package, which is called SWAT Cup, which can assist in obtaining calibrated values for model parameters. SWAT Cup program could be used to perform calibration, validation, sensitivity analysis, one at a time, and global, and uncertainty analysis. So here, um, I'm giving um, an example of um, a calibrated model over the lower Mekong River Basin. As you can see on your right, there are six um, stations. These stations across the lower Mekong um, River, and we can see the metrics that can um, give us an understanding of the calibration of the model. And these metrics are here defined by the NSE and the era of simulated flow. Uh, on your um, left, this is just a figure that shows you the locations of these stations that we um, used to conduct the calibration. After we calibrate the model, we wanted to verify the model. And this step is done after calibration. So usually verification step um, is very, very important because we normally examine the model behavior during times beyond the calibration periods. Um, as you can see in the previous slide, we um, basically calibrated the model for a specific time period. Now we will um, assess the behavior of the model within time periods beyond that um, calibration time period. Um, this is basically important because the SWOT model verification assures the model is capable of simulating processes outside the training periods. And here, the same um, six locations that we um, um, did in the calibration, we examined them for the verification step. And we assess the verification results by obtaining the national um, Sutcliffe efficiency metric. 
After covering the first part, which was the soil and water assessment tool, now we will go to the second part, um, which is the NASA Access. So what is NASA Access? NASA Access is an open source platform for uh, accessing and presenting quantitative remote sensing Earth observations and climate data products in an interactive format so that scientists, uh, stakeholders, and concerned citizens can engage in the exploration, modeling, and understanding of the data. On your right, um, you will see the GitHub landing page for NASA Access. And as access is a free tool and it is an open source, as we just said. So you can um, easily uh, test, uh, utilize, and examine to see how it can help you in your uh, modeling exercise. Um, NASA Access um, is available into different formats, as we can um, explain in the um, next slides. So looking upon this animation, which shows um, rain da data collected by the Global Precipitation Mission, GPM, Core Observatory, one might ask how can we ingest this data into SWOT or any other hydrological model? NASA Access Platform is developed to assist you in answering this question. Basically, NASA Access Platform provides Format, formatted data that can be ingested into any hydrological model. Moreover, NASA Access has a web-based application that can be used to visualize remote sensing data. So NASA Access is a modular, which means it can be hosted on public and private servers. Here we give the existing functions of the NASA Access platform. Um, NASA Access Platform is an ongoing um, platform. So the, um, every time we add new um, function and new tool to the platform. And here we can group them into two main groups, climate and weather. In the climate group, we have functions that can access and reformat data from CMAP5 and CMAP6 downscale data, data sets. And in the weather group, NASA Access can access and reformat data from GPM, GLDAS, uh, and uh, various functions that include averaging over the centroid of the study area domain or collecting the available grids within the watershed um, domain are available. The benefits. What are the benefits of NASA Access? NASA Access can be um, summarized into two main points. It can give us um, time because it will save time for scientists tasked with analyzing weather and climate data, as well as developing hydrological model. As we just showed in the previous slides, if you have that GPM data and you wanted to use it for your SWOT model, NASA Access can help you in doing that. NASA Access can help you to um, process downscale climate data from CMAP5, CMAP6 collections, the NASA Access can help you to access uh, GLDAS um, data products and so on. And the other benefit for NASA Access, it's uh, bridging the gap for non-technically trained stakeholders and decision makers charged with water, climate, and environmental management decisions. Um, this uh, basically is very, very important, um, especially with the web-based web um, feature of NASA Access, because you can visualize you can analyze the remote sensing data um, without the need for any advanced um, software program. Here um, we give images of the current NASA Access R library and as well as the Conda package. So NASA Access is available as an R package. You can go to GitHub, install it. NASA Access is available as a Conda package. You can go to um, Conda Forge and easily install it in your um, environment, Conda environment. Um, here um, we give the NASA Access web-based application home window, and this is an app that you can install in your um, private uh, laptop, uh, machine, server, 
um, and it can um, do all the jobs that NASA Access um, have, as well as giving another feature, which is visualizing the data that you processed. So the user can upload a shape file and a digital elevation model for his domain, for his study area, and then select any available function with the, tem the temporal period uh, desired. After processing the data, the user will receive an email saying the data is ready, so he can then um, start visualizing and analyzing the data products. Here, um, I give a small example that uh, explains, for example, when we are accessing precipitation data from the near real time uh, product, GPM uh, NRT product. Um, here, the latency is one day. Um, you can see that um, on your left, um, this is the function um, that you need to um, uh, provide some input to it. Basically, what uh, directory that you wanted the data to be at and give the um, shape file for your study area, the digital elevation model for your study area, and then what are the temporal um, periods that you are interested at. Um, after you provide this and you run the function, um, it will basically go and translate this into um, URL, um, and that URL is going to go and communicate with NASA servers and obtain the needed data products and format it in a way that can be seen on your right um, as um, time series or um, a figure that can be used in your um, analysis. Here, the same example, if we just look at it from um, our studio, as you can see on your left, top left, this is uh, the script, um, basically the same function that I just um, explained before. And on the bottom, you see the R console, how after installing NASA Access and running this function, um, this is the result that you will get. On your right, um, you will see um, files that we call it SWAT ready weather input data. So if you wanted, for example, that data to be an input for SWAT model, you can just take these files and, and put it in your SWAT model projects. These files are ready formatted, so you don't need to do anything with it. You, it um, a SWAT will be able to read it and um, fill the database with the data uh, smoothly. This is a flowchart that um, summarizes the web-based um, uh, NASA Access application. Um, it, it begins from the left by um, the available data products that NASA Access now have linkage to, and then it, uh, it will have um, the user inputs um, as shapefile, digital elevation model, the the time period that is the user is interested at. And after that, this will be translated into um, code that is going to create URLs, and that URLs will basically communicate these downloads from NASA servers, and then obtain the data, process it, um, format it, and after that, make it easy for you to visualize to ingest into your hydrological modeling experiment. So in summary for this part, um, the soil and water assessment tool, SWAT, is a small watershed to river basin scale model used to simulate the quality and quantity of surface and groundwater and predict the environmental impact of land use, land managed practices, and climate change. NASA Access is an open source platform for accessing and presenting quantitative remote sensing Earth observations and climate data products. NASA Access can be used to ingest Earth remote sensing data into a SWOT model. With that, I conclude the first part of this, of this second session, and I pass the microphone to my colleague Mandy to continue with the second part of this session. Thank you for listening. Mandy, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ibrahim, for introducing the initial SWOT content. 
Uh, I'm Mandy Lopez. I'll be talking more in depth about how we evaluate fire impacts on watershed health using the SWAP model. So to give some background first about why we're interested in modeling fire at all, uh, we have seen that globally wildfire activity is increasing in frequency and severity. This is happening as climate change uh, progresses and we see changes in precipitation patterns and so on. So as these fires become more prevalent, we want to understand what this means for watersheds. If you look at the upper right hand figure, you can see this kind of graphic demonstrating a fire burning through a land surface. You lose vegetation cover, you increase erosion, and this results in increased amounts of sediment and burned material entering into rivers and streams, which end up in lakes, reservoirs, and the ocean. Our project uh, wants to understand what this increase in sediment loading, which can also have increases in nutrients or contaminants alongside it, what does this mean for the ecology of lakes, rivers, and the coastal ocean? For example, as increased sediments enter the coastal ocean, we might see decreased water clarity which could impact primary producers like phytoplankton or kelp that rely on sunlight penetrating the water column. Another impact that we're thinking about is as sediment loads or nutrient loads like nitrogen or phosphorus increase into uh, water bodies, what does that mean for algal blooms? Will we see uh, increased eutrophication or things like that? So our big picture, uh, goal here is to try and understand how hydrologic processes are being impacted by wildfires so that we can in turn get a better understanding of how our aquatic ecosystems are impacted. So the soil and water assessment tool, which you've already heard quite a bit about, is a watershed model. It goes by the name SWAT commonly. Uh, in this uh, demonstration, in this study, we're going to be looking at simulating stream discharge and sediment load and the model is typically calibrated using in situ observations of discharge or sediment load at monitoring gauges. Uh, in the scope of this training we will not get into the model calibration and validation steps but I'll briefly comment on them here. So this diagram that you're seeing at the bottom of the slide is just a schematic walkthrough of what the SWOT modeling process is like. Your step one would be to prepare and input some basic information into the SWOT model. That information includes elevation, land and soil cover, and climate data, uh, particularly precipitation and air temperature data. Once you feed these inputs into SWOT, it will run and simulate stream discharge and sediment load, which is step two shown in this workflow. In step three, you move on to model calibration, where you do a, a comparison of the model simulated discharge and sediment load to the in situ observations of discharge and sediment load. And when you compare simulated and observed, in the calibration step, you are tuning model parameters. You're tweaking and turning different parameter ranges to try and get the best possible fit between simulations and observations. When you have a nice fit, you move on to model validation. And in this step, you're taking a new fresh subset of observational data and doing a second comparison of model simulations to in situ observations. The difference is that during validation, we are no longer tuning any of the model parameters. Nothing is changed. It is all held constant from step three in calibration. So in validation, when you do your second comparison, you're looking to see, do you still have a good fit between simulations and observations? And if you do have a good fit, then we consider that the model is both calibrated and validated. It's demonstrated to replicate on the ground processes well enough based on our observational data that we can move forward and interpret the actual model outputs, which is step five. 
in this training, I'll be doing a demonstration of step one, where you're actually setting up the SWOT model with the different input data sets. All the other steps are going to be beyond the scope of what we cover today. The SWOT example that I will be demonstrating is of the Woolsey Fire, which burned near Malibu, California in 2018. If you look at the figure on the right, this is Southern California near Los Angeles, near Malibu. The blue outline is the watershed, the Malibu Creek watershed that we'll be looking at today. The pink shading area is the burn extent of the Woolsey Fire. The black triangles are climate data stations. This is stations where we have precipitation and air temperature data that will be fed into the model from. The red star is the location of our in-situ monitoring gauge. This is where we have actual observations of discharge and sediment load that we'll be using or that you would use to calibrate and validate the model, which again is not going to be covered in this training. In the table on the left, you have a uh, kind of just a recap of what I've talked about, the SWOT inputs, what they are, elevation, land cover, soil cover, and so on, and then the data source. So when I demonstrate, you're going to see different data sets, and this provides you details of where those data came from. Uh, one thing I want to point out here, and I'm about to get into more detail, is about the land cover. Because in our project, we're looking to simulate fire within a watershed, which means we have to find some way to tell SWAT that a fire happened. And in our study, we've chosen to do that using this land cover input. What we're doing is taking a pre-fire land cover layer, in this case is the National Land Cover Database from 2016, and we modify it with a burn severity map. Uh, for this study, we're using a soil burn severity map from the California Geological Survey. So what we end up doing is creating two different land cover inputs, one that represents pre-fire conditions in the watershed and one that represents post-fire conditions. Um, this slide is showing just a little more detail about that post-fire land use map that I'm talking about. So we start with your uh, unburned or pre-fire land use cover. You overlay soil burn severity, which uh, the left figure, this is a map of soil burn severity for the Woolsey fire that we used. We overlaid land cover with soil burn severity and wherever those two layers intersected, we did a reclassification. So that if, for example, before the fire, the land use was a forest area, but during the Woolsey fire, it had a low burn. It would then become reclassified to forest low burn within our model. And this new land cover class, forest low burn, would have unique parameter changes, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that represent fire conditions in that particular location. So, this, uh, what you're seeing on the right-hand side, this is the reclassified post-fire land use map, where we already did the overlay of pre-fire and burn severity to create this new land cover output. All right, so on this slide, it details the different changes that are made to parameters within burned land cover classes in your new post-fire land use map. You change curve number, modified universal soil loss equation K factor, and leaf area index parameters. The reason these parameters are changed is because they each relate to something that we associate with fire occurrence. For example, curve number and K factor are related to soil, be it soil erosion or permeability, and leaf area index factors are related to plant cover, evapotranspiration, and so on. In our model, we decided to increase the curve number and K factor, which would increase surface erosion and runoff, which is what we expect after a fire. And we also decided to reduce leaf area index parameters to reflect vegetation loss on the ground. When I go through the demonstration, I'll give more detail and show more explicitly what I mean by changing these parameters. 
Next thing you'll use is the land use update tool. This is a feature in SWAT that allows the model simulation to run using one designated land cover input and then switch to a separate designated land cover in input during the model run. So in our case, the Woolsey fire occurs in November of 2018. Using the land use update tool, we run the SWAT model using the pre-fire land use input up until November 2018. And then when the model reaches that date, it will switch to using the post-fire land cover input that we created. Now, in order for the land use update tool to be activated within SWAT, there are a number of input files that have to be uh, created. And there are a few different ways out there to make these files and set up your model to activate the land use update tool. In my demonstration, I will be showing the first method that's listed, uh, the SWAT underscore LUC tool. Uh, but there are also a couple of others with, which I have linked as well in case you want to try those out. Uh, and for reference, the two figures that are shown here on the left, it is the pre-fire land use. On the right, it is the post-fire land use. So you can visibly get a sense of how land use changed pre and post-fire. Now, although we are not going to be going through calibration and validation. I wanted to show just a little bit about how this particular example is calibrated and validated and perhaps it can help others if you decide to pursue this and get into this step. But in our case, uh, we have one monitor engage and it has daily discharge for the 20 year study period, which is 2000 to 2020. For our model, we are interested in using data uh, pre-fire for the calibration and validation. We don't wanna use any of that data um, for calibration and validation because we wanna interpret that. That's when the fire happened and we're interested in investigating. So in our approach, we wanted to look at a subset a chunk of data that's happening uh, between the years 2003 and 2016 or so. And of that time span, we wanted to break it up into a calibration subset and a validation subset. And the way that uh, you do that is to look at your hydrograph or look at your precipitation. In this case, the graph is showing uh, discharge on the uh, is the dark gray line and the vertical y-axis on your left has the values for that. Precipitation is a dashed blue line and the vertical y-axis on your right is the um, graph or the values for that. And time is shown across your x-axis. When we subset data into calibration and validation chunks, we want to choose periods of similar wet dry seasonality or in other words you don't want to have all of your calibration be set in a dry period and all of your validation be set in a wet period because then you're choosing two hydrologically quite different data sets you want to have comparable uh, subsets of data so what you're seeing here is the green shading is showing the time period that we used for calibration the yellow shading is showing the time period that we chose for validation. And if you look at the metrics shown at the bottom of the slide, there's a similar stream average discharge in these time periods with a similar standard deviation. And this is what we want to see, that there is both wet and dry periods covered within both uh, subsets. And on this slide, we just have some very preliminary results of our modeling efforts. Uh, this is showing you the post-fire period, which is covering the years 2018 to 2020. The dashed kind of green line is showing you where the Woolsey fire occurred. This is the subset of model data that we're actually interpreting for our uh, study. We want to understand how the Woolsey fire impacted sediment load and discharge. And uh, as you can see, following the Woolsey fire, 
there's big peaks in both uh, in the simulated and observed variables, the red lines and the blue lines. It turns out that following the Woolsey fire, almost within a month, we had huge rains, a big rain event that came. So uh, we had fire and then almost immediately a lot of precipitation that allowed us to capture this big peak that you're seeing on these graphs. Uh, in our modeling effort, uh, you can see that there's a pretty decent matchup between the blue and red lines, between our simulated and observed, which is demonstrating that our model is currently doing a pretty good job of capturing that first post-fire peak immediately following the Woolsey fire. If you look further down that timeline toward uh, the end of 2019, early 2020, there are some smaller peaks where the matchup between simulated and observed isn't as great. And we're hypothesizing, and something that we're actively investigating is that perhaps this is a recovery signal that our model, that the results that you see here are tuned for post-fire conditions, but perhaps uh, pre-fire conditions are more representative of those later peaks in, in that, or in other words, that our watershed is recovering. And so that's something that is an ongoing investigation. Okay. To kind of shift away from that Woolsey fire example and just zoom out, our study is not the only one to try and apply SWOT to fire impacts in a watershed. On this slide, I've listed a couple of other examples in the literature. Um, some previous work has shown that SWAT can estimate post-fire discharge sediment load and other water quality parameters similar to what we have found uh, in 2017. Basso et al. Um, in showed that uh, fire impacted watershed had increased nitrate and phosphate, uh, which in their case they looked at local regulatory thresholds and saw that it, you know, those increases um, were had regulatory implications as well. Um, so this is an example where the SWOT model, along with fires in a watershed, was used to talk about nutrient loading and pollution. Uh, Havel et al. particularly looked at runoff and sediment post-fire in a Colorado watershed and also were able to constrain and tune the model to capture what they observed with monitoring gauges. So, the table down here is showing um, kind of a summary from the Basel et al. paper where in unburned versus burned, or in their case, they put wildfire scenarios, they could uh, capture the impacts of wildfire within that watershed that they modeled. So if you're interested in getting into more details about how to tweak and change your SWOT model to capture fire, I would direct you to these papers. Um, there's not a whole lot out there yet. It's still kind of an emerging field, but the, these papers are good for getting a better sense of how it's done. And in summary, uh, our project is really interested in understanding how fires can increase stream flow, sediment load, and nutrient load in watersheds. Other previous work have demonstrated that this does occur, and we are interested in using SWOT to quantitatively constrain the changes in discharge, sediment load, and nutrient load. Um, this application of the SWOT model, as I just mentioned, is pretty new and emerging, so there is lots of different ways that you can change SWOT. Um, to try and capture fire and in our way is just one of the many ways that it could be done. So um, if users are interested in, in exploring this more, uh, I'd be happy to chat more about that. All right, so in today's demonstration, I'll be using ArcSWAT, which plugs into ArcGIS but there is also a QSWAT version of this so that you do not need to use proprietary software. I uh, just wanted to direct your attention to this uh, for users that don't use ArcGIS. This recording is going to be available 
uh, on the training website. So you'll be able to go back and follow at your own pace. Uh, today, I'll be moving through it quite quickly for time's sake, but there will be a longer video demonstration available as well as a step-by-step -step guide. So afterward, you can go take a look at those materials if you'd like to get a better sense of uh, how to do this. Okay. So the first thing I'll do is start by opening a blank untitled ArcMap document. And up here is the SWAT tool, uh, SWAT, Arc SWAT interface plugin. I'm going to open a new SWAT project. I do not need to save my blank document. We're going to set up our project. Uh, for the project, you need to have a DEM, a land use, a mask is optional. In our demonstration, I'll be using a mask. To set up your project, you point it to the folder that has your materials. Now, if you go back to that folder, you'll see that it is populated with SWAT uh, databases and some other files. Next, you're going to delineate your watershed using the watershed delineator tool. First thing will be to read in your DEM. So we'll go back to that folder, select your DEM, load it in. You can see it loads, it populates in the background. I'll read in a mask, which in our case tells ArcSWAT to only use an area of our choosing. You can see this black raster is the mask. That's, I know that it covers my watershed of interest and it just helps cut down on some of the processing that ArcSWAT will have to do. Next, you'll click flow direction and accumulation. Under this area, I'm going to modify it to be 250. There's more information about this in the long form video guide as well as the step-by-step -step guide, so I won't describe why I'm doing that now. Next thing you'll do is click Create Streams and Outlets. You see the uh, in the background different stream networks start to be defined. Next you'll move to the Outlet and Inlet definition box. This is where you're going to point to your monitoring gauge locations, which is a .dbf file. Again, more details are in the long form video as well as step-by-step -step guide. This is how SWAT knows where your monitoring gauges are in your watershed. Next, you're going to tell SWAT where your watershed outlet is. and then click delineate watershed. So now you'll see that SWAT has created a boundary for your watershed, including the stream network, which is in blue and sub basins, which are outlined in purple. You're going to next click Calculate Subbasin Parameters. When the process completes, you can click exit on the watershed delineator menu and save your project. Now you'll see your watershed as well as some different features about it like the stream reaches and uh, basin, things like that. Different outlets are all populated uh, for you to toggle on and off. 
after your watershed delineation, you're going to modify some databases in your project. This only happens in your post-fire project. If you're doing a pre-fire model, you don't have to worry about these extra steps that I'm about to show. But what you need to do is uh, modify some land uses before we move on to the next step. So you go to your project folder, to the SWAT 2012 database, open it up. Open the crop tab. And we're going to add in some information. These are adding in the burned area land uses. Since this is a post fire model, we copy and we paste. We're going to add some more land uses to the urban tab. These are urban land use classes. We'll repeat that for the urban default as well. Let's fix those. Now that we've made these changes, we'll save and close. Now that we have done that, we can go back to our SWAT project and define our HR use. So now you're going to read in your land use layer. I'm going to select value. This is how SWAT understands what the different land use codes are. We're going to use a lookup table so that SWAT can read more detail. Okay. So now we've loaded our land uses, uh, including the different burned areas uh, that we changed using burn severity, and SWAT has been able to understand it using the coding that we described. For soils, we're going to use the StatsGo database that comes with SWAT. I will not change anything and hit replace. For slope in our watershed, we're going to be using three different slope classes. There's detail about how you choose slope classes and define them in the longer version, as well as the step-by-step -step guide. For this case, we're using three classes with different slope grades defined between 0 and 9 percent, 9 and 18 percent, and greater than 18 percent. I'm going to click Create HRU Feature Class for my watershed because it is a small watershed. If your watershed is large, do not use this feature, and then click Overlay. Now you have defined HRUs, or I'm sorry, now you have created HRUs and we're going to fine tune them. I'm going to use some thresholding to eliminate very uh, small percentage cases where land use is less than 10% or soil class is less than 10% or slope class is less than 10% of an HRU. We're going to disregard those because they are a very small percentage of the area. Because this is the post-fire model and we have burned areas that we want to make sure we don't ignore, we're going to institute an exemption so that none of the burned areas are going to accidentally get um, kicked out based on the thresholds that I just set on that previous tab. So I selected all of the burned land use classes and exempted them. They will be kept in the model. You'll notice I left low burn and moderate burn water, WA, uh, in the uh, out of the exemption on purpose uh, because burned water doesn't really represent anything. So that's not something we need to keep in our watershed. 
now will disregard elevation bands because in our particular case study here of Malibu Creek watershed, uh, we do not have to worry about elevation that uh, interferes with snow and ice and things like that. Click create HRUs. Okay. Now that that's completed, your HRUs have been created and you can click on this HRU on analysis reports if you'd like to see some information about the different HRUs and how they were um, differentiated in your watershed. So this is just a re resource you can look back on. You'll see along the side here, we have all of the inputs that we've loaded to date so that you can toggle on and off if you wanna take a deeper look at to how your soils or your slope classes or land uses are um, distributed in your watershed. Next, we're going to use the right input tables feature. Click on weather stations. We're gonna use a weather simulator. If you're in the United States, you can use any option except WGEN underscore user. This is only used if you're in a watershed outside of the United States. You have to select this first one. For rainfall, we have uh, precipitation data prepared for use in the model. You're gonna select rain gauges and then navigate to your project folder. And you're gonna read in your precipitation header file. For temperature data, you're gonna click climate stations, go to your project folder and read in uh, your temperature header file. For relative humidity, solar radiation, and wind speed data, we're gonna use the simulation option that ArcSWAT has and click okay. Processing is complete. You can close out of this window and we're going to save the project. Next, we're going to write the SWOT input files. This is under write input tables, write SWOT input files. You're going to select all and then click create tables. You'll get this pop up and just click yes. All right, click OK. Now you can close out of this menu and save your project. All right, this is only again for post-fire, we're going to do some more database edits. If you're in a pre-fire model, you can skip the next little bit that we're gonna do. I'm gonna save this project and close it. Now you'll navigate to your project folder and we're gonna make some edits in the project Microsoft Access database. Should open this up. You're going to edit. First, we'll edit the soil database. So double click soil. Parameter we want to change is going to be the SLK. Here it is. So first, I'll make sure that this is sorted from smallest to largest. Okay, good. That sorting simply so that I can copy and paste from this example chain, uh, this example Excel file. And you make these edits on your own, following the demo materials, I recommend doing the sort just to make sure everything is in the right order when you paste. tend to do a quick visual check just to make sure. I know for, based on my experience, that this is a burned area class. So I'm just gonna do a quick double check and make sure, yes, the SLK was one of those changed values. So it looks like, at least at a brief glance, it looks like it copied and pasted correctly. Next, I'm gonna change the leaf area index, underscore I and IT parameter, this is going to be in the management database. Okay. 
here it is. Make sure this is sorted. Leave it. Copy. And again, quick visual inspection. Yep, this is a burned area. It was changed. It looks about right. Of course, when you do this, maybe spend a few extra minutes making sure everything copied over correctly. All right, so we'll save the database and close. So now we've made the changes to our project database. We're going to open it back up. Click on our ArcMap document. So we changed a couple of things in our project database, and we want to make sure that SWOT knows we changed that. So we're going to go to under Edit SWOT Inputs, Rewrite SWOT Input Files. We made changes to the soil and management. So we're going to select those two and click Write Files. Done. So now everything is updated. This Unswap project has our little modified inputs. Now we're going to actually set up and run the SWAT simulation. So under SWAT simulation, run SWAT. Just take a glance, make sure this is the correct time period for your model for this project. That is correct. You can modify your printout settings. I'm going to leave it as monthly, which means SWAT's going to give me monthly time step outputs for discharge and sediment, whatever other parameters. And why skip is the model warm-up period. For my model, I'm using three years. Under SWAT.exe version, you can choose the version you'd like to run. I'm going to use the 64-bit release. Now I'm going to click Setup SWAT Run. OK. Once that's done, the Run SWAT option will become clickable. So you're going to click Run SWAT, and next you'll see an interface pop up. And this is the model actually running. In my case, it's 21 years, so you're going to see it execute up to year 21. OK, SWAT run is successful. Click all right. At this point, you can close out of this and save your project. Now you're going to go to read SWAT output under the SWAT simulation option. The most common files that people like to look at are the outputs by REACH, by Subbasin, and by HRU. So those are the three I'm going to click, but you can see there are many options. I'll import these to the database. Remember that project database we had just made some edits to. We'll now have output uh, files or output tabs that you can go to and look at the model output for. Uh, running SWAT check is optional. This is a very broad brushstroke overview of your model. I'll just click on it to show you for this example. It'll open up a new window. You'll click Examine Model Output, and uh, it'll just give you a very, uh, like I say, high, high scale, broad scale overview. Here's your simulation length. It was 21 years with the warm-up period. It tells you some stuff about your watershed. And you can kind of click through, and it gives you some nice uh, preliminary estimates of here's what precipitation or curve number or runoff is going to look like in your watershed. And it'll give you some messages about uh, maybe your groundwater ratio doesn't look quite right or things like that. It does this for sediment for nitrogen, phosphorus, and you can, you know, so on and so forth. All of these things are just to make you aware. Uh, when you actually get into your model calibration and validation is where you can really dig into making changes to tune your model um, to be more accurate. Uh, the save so optional. Uh, because you can continue to tweak within the ArcSWAT interface. For example, you could go back and make more database edits and then run the model again. And you know, you can kind of uh, keep playing around. And if you want to look at different iterations, this is where saving your simulation will be helpful. So as practice for myself, I always save each simulation so I can go back and look at 
things if I make changes. Okay. So at this point, you have set up and run your SWOT model. That's all you have to do. Um, but in the case of fire, remember, in order to use the land use update tool, you actually have to set up a pre-fire model and a post-fire model. What I just showed you is post-fire, but you would repeat most of these steps and do a pre-fire as well. Now, to use the land use update tool, which is the feature that bridges a pre-fire and post-fire model together, uh, that requires using some R scripts, but for brevity, we're not going to cover that today. It is included in the long form video as well as the step by step guide, so you can go refer to those to implement the tool and the scripts. All right, that concludes the demonstration. I'm going to pass this off to Sean and I'll be around for the question and answer session. Thank you, Mandy, for the wonderful demonstration of running ArcSWAT. To summarize what we learned today, fires have been shown to increase stream flow, sediment loads, and nutrient loads in watersheds. SWAT can be used to quantitatively constrain fire-related increases in water quantity and qual quality parameters. This application of SWAT is relatively new. There is the potential to continue development. And looking ahead to our third and final part, which is part three, in part three, we will focus on identifying global socioeconomic data sets and land cover products useful for assessing the impact of fire on population, infrastructure, and land use and land cover types. Acquiring land use and land cover maps for a watershed of interest, and evaluating the severity of post-fire burns within a watershed of interest. As stated earlier, there will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. Answers must be completed via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. Homework will be made available on July 13th with a due date of July 27th. Parts 1 and 3 will include hands-on exercises to assess pre-fire risk and post-fire impact on a watershed using Google Earth Engine JavaScript. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course. Below is the contact information for Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Lopez, along with links to RSET website and social media. We hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications of future trainings. And please do follow us on Twitter and YouTube. Below are links to SWAT resources for your benefit, along with prerequisites for running SWAT and the NASA Access Data Tool. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Thank you. Wonderful. And, and, and again, we've been getting some really terrific questions. So thank you to everybody that's been submitting them. And we do have uh, roughly 17 minutes left. So if you do have a question and you've not uh, posted it in the question box, we hope that you will do so. Uh, jumping right into it, question number one, we can use several tools for the same remote sensing analysis like R, Python, SportLiz, SWAT, Earth Engine, etc. However, what about accuracy? How can we know which tool is able to perform more accurately than others? Or what about their limitations? And I will hand this over to Dr. Lopez to answer question number one. All right, can you hear me? Yep, Mandy, we sure can. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so for this question, um, I I get a little bit of information about SWAT. And so if you have this and then I see Ibrahim also added some commentary uh, below that, but I'll just talk to what I wrote, which is that in this training, we're specifically demonstrating how remote sense data can be used as inputs into the SWAT hydrological model. So there, of course, are going to be uncertainties associated with those remotely sensed data sets, which are 
normally going to be summarized when you go to download that data in a supporting documentation or on the data download portal. Aside from that, uh, in SWOT itself, the calibration and validation steps are where you're actually comparing what the model simulates to in situ activations. And, and there are some statistics that we use to evaluate the goodness of fit between simulated and in situ. Uh, and then the SWOT CUP software, which is the calibration and validation software, uses a 95% prediction uncertainty band or 95 PPU uh, to constrain the range of model simulations. And that's basically how SWOT addresses the accuracy of its model outputs is to um, give model outputs the same of 95 CPU band, um, which it kind of gives you more detailed languages uh, on the document here. But all of that kind of bigger picture here is that the uncertainty characterization for SWAT is going to look different than the uncertainty characterization that uh, maybe a remotely sensed data product has, you know, and it's hard to compare those or know which tool is going to be the most accurate. Um, that's I tried to give maybe a more spot focused answer to that question. Uh, Ibrahim, I see you have some other details. Do you want to go ahead and talk about what you wrote? Great, uh, wonderful, yeah, and thank you. And 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 Mandy, I was wondering, uh, it seems like you're you're uh, somewhat muffled. Can you try to get maybe as close to the microphone as you can? I think that might help with the clarity. Thank you. Oh, sure. Is it any better? Uh, can you uh, keep talking? Uh, testing, testing. Yes, perfect. Yeah, that is much better. Thank you so much. Awesome, great. Uh, so jumping into question number two. In a time of climate change, especially approaching a tipping point, how does calibrating and verifying models make sense? If first and second order statistics are not stationary, how can a model accurately predict the future? And Dr. Lopez, back to you. Sure, yeah, so this is a challenge as we know that climate change is progressing and therefore, hydrological processes are going to change. Uh, but one way that we can account for this is to model over long time periods that have variable climate conditions so that you have plenty of model time simulation uh, to work with for calibration and validation. So if you're only modeling over the course of five to 10 years, that's relatively short for the scale that climate change can happen on. But if you can run the model for a, a much longer time period, maybe on the order of 20 plus years, you're hopefully capturing quite a bit of variability in precipitation and air temperature and things like that. So that when you move into calibrating and validating the model, you have plenty of time record to use to kind of train SWAT to capture all of the different seasonality in um, on the ground conditions so that hopefully you have confidence that your SWAT model can reflect the range of conditions that your watershed might reasonably experience uh, within the, the time period that you actually want to interpret data for. That said, you, which is kind of what we've done in our project. We have a 20 year model period and we've used as much of that as we can for calibrating and validating, leaving only the, the few years post fire for interpretation. And the idea being that if we're pretty confident that we are, our models performing well in both calibration and validation, um, that we can then go back and synthetically alter climate variables and then look at how outputs change and it's not necessarily a uh like true prediction it's more of a let me tinker with what the model is doing manually 
and then see how the output changes. And we can use that in a predictive way to say, okay, if we anticipate that climate is going to change by reduced precipitation and higher air temperatures, what then does the model output under those scenarios? And we kind of call those predictions. Great, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Question number three, is there any model like SWOT for assessing the impact of climate change on forest fire? Um, I personally am not familiar with other models that uh, are being used to uh, evaluate the impact of climate change on forest fires. I see that there have been some others listed here by Ibrahim. NASA LAS, RESIS, DHS, VM. I personally am not familiar with these, so I would encourage whoever asked this to maybe Google them if they're interested. Um, but for SWAT itself, this application of fire simulation is relatively new and rare. There are maybe a few, um, a few studies that have done it, ours among them. Uh, yeah, I don't have much more information on that end. Okay, great. Uh, moving on, question number four. In the SWAT demonstration uh, and National Land Cover Database NLCD, da NLCD data set is used with a California Geological Survey burn severity data set. Are these data sets available for every state or are there other data sets available? How often are these data, data sets updated? Yeah, so in my case, I can only speak to California since that's where I've worked. Uh, I know within California, there are uh, a few different places that have burn severity data sets. Uh, California Geological Survey is one of them. It does not have a burn severity data set for every single fire. Uh, the California Geological Survey only selects uh, some of the fires in the state. But there are some other databases like the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Data product. Uh, that one, I believe, has the biggest coverage of fires in the US and maybe beyond. So I would start there. Uh, there's also a newer database um, from a paper that was published last year called the Wildfire Burn Severity and Emissions Inventory. That, I believe, covers most California fires over the last decade or so. Uh, I haven't checked that database in quite a while, but I believe they are actively updating it. So uh, for burn severity, I would look at least for California at those three options. If you're in a different state, maybe inquire with your state's geological agency to see what they have. Um, but for the National Land Cover data set, the NLCD, that's updated about every five years. And the, uh, the data portal is, is pretty well maintained with um, documentation of, of when it's being updated and how it's changed. Great, thank you, Mandy. Uh, question number five, are there SWAT tools that will run in ArcGIS Pro? No, unfortunately, um, to my knowledge, and at this point, SWAT is not compatible with ArcGIS Pro. Um, maybe that might change. I have no idea. It seems like the the people SWAT has such a, a large user base that that maybe if there's enough demand, the someone somewhere might be persuaded to make it work. But um, to my knowledge, it does not work with ArcGIS Pro, and it requires certain working versions of ArcGIS. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I put a link to that question uh, in the answer to that question um, to the website that, act that gives all the details of which version of ArcGIS you would need to use ArcSpot. Great, question number six. Is it required, <clears throat> excuse me, is it required to have Microsoft access to use SWAT or can you just use Excel? I don't believe you need to go out of your way to acquire Microsoft Access. Um, when you download and install SWAT, it comes with everything that you need so that when you run uh, SWAT on your computer, it will 
automatically create that database for you um, and store the data in that structure. I think it would be helpful if you had the Microsoft Access license so that you could work with those files that SWAT generates more easily, but I, I don't think um, don't think you need more than that. The, that one, maybe when you go to install and use SWAT, I would take a closer look at the um, manual when you do the installation. Great, question number seven. Could you please provide us with some resources to help with model calibration and verification for the tutorial presented today? Ah, uh, yeah, that, I, I believe it looks like Ibrahim might have put a link to a manuscript and I can also add some links as well, but there are a, a good handful of papers by Dr. Kareem Abaspor, who is a uh, large, uh, largely uh, one of the prominent developers of SWAT Cup, which is the calibration software. He, if you go to YouTube and just put SWAT Cup in, you'll probably, um, it'll pop right up, but I'll put some links in this document. Uh, there's a large suite of YouTube tutorials for the calibration and validation, and there are some papers by Dr. Abbaspor. So I'll, I'll put these links uh, in the answer to this question. Terrific, and question number eight. Given different soil characteristics and properties that vary area to area, can SWAT be applied to any geographical area? Uh, yes, it can be applied to any geographical area uh, as long as you have the inputs that SWAT needs. So for example, I see the, in my demonstration, I did it for California, and SWAT has a um, US StatsGo soil database already loaded, but you as the user can define your own soil input um, from however or wherever you, you get it from, be it from a state or federal agency or even a soil raster layer that you went out and created and made yourself. Uh, you can change the soil input to be appropriate to your area. Um, I'm just looking at Ibrahim's answer really quick to make sure that I did not leave anything out. Yeah, I think I cover what I covered what you kind of mentioned here. Okay, wonderful. And question number nine, is there a version of QSWAT that is compatible with a Mac operating system? Yes. Short answer, yes. Um, I will uh, search around, but this can also just be Googled. Um, there, There is a version of it. I don't remember exactly what it's called. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lopez, so much, I, I, and, and also Ibrahim, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for, for answering, doing such a great job in, in, in addressing all the questions that were posed by the participants uh, for the part two. Um, uh, we want, as we wrap up, I want to thank each and every person that did join us today for the second part. I uh, want to remind everybody that this Thursday in two days, at the same time, we'll be concluding this webinar series uh, when, we, uh, when we have the final part. Uh, and so we do hope that you'll join us all in two days at the same time. I also want to thank our guest uh, presenters today, uh, Dr. Amanda Lopez and Dr. Ibrahim Mohammed. Thank you both so much for contributing this wonderful content and demonstrations uh, using uh, Arc SWAT uh, in in the in the Malibu Fire in Southern California. And I also want to thank the entire RSET team. You might not have heard or seen us, but they've been working very hard in the background to make this uh, training a success and possible. And that's uh, uh, Amita Mekta, Brittany Beaudry. Brock Blevins, Natasha, Natasha johnson Griffin, Sarah Cutshaw, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, Jonathan O'Brien, and Sue Munthy. So thank you to the entire RSET team, and we look forward to seeing you all on Thursday for the final part of the webinar series. Thank you.